welcome to this week's edition of Beers and Bites with our co-host, Chris Jordan of Fluency Security and Jeremy Murdershaw of Fortify 24 by 7. Today's special guest is Tony Cole, who is the CPO at Ativo Networks. And what you'll find is that they do a lot of cyber deception, otherwise known, I believe, as honeypots and things of that nature. Hold on, sit tight. We've got a lot to learn. But first, let's talk about the different beers we have going today, folks. Chris, start us off. In uh, Leesburg, Virginia. And this one is my imaginary girlfriend, level eight. Uh, can't ask for anything better than that. An Indian pale ale. We'll see how it goes. And then I've, I've got my back up here. I've got, I can't even pronounce it, sanctimonious enmity here. This is the adroit guys with that hazy, hazy IPA. So I'm in case Tony goes extra hours, I got this, and then I got some free love out there and stuff. So I'm I'm ready for for a nice uh, a nice talk, Tony. Well, I'm surprised you're balancing that beer on that beautiful antique next to you. Not an antique. <laughs> this, this is it's an Apple Lisa. <laughs> yeah, rub it three times on the head and let's see what happens. Oh, <laughs> Jeremy. <laughs> All right, today I've got my uh, my primary beer is what we call the uh, Almanac West Coast IPA. Yeah, nice. it's, big de- it's pretty decent, uh, 6.4%. Uh, then my backup beer is my my daily drinker, the uh, Voodoo Ranger Juicy Haze IPA from New Belgium. Just love this beer. Nice. Tony, what do you bring today? So my beer delivery is not here yet. I'm hoping it will get here before the podcast is over. And that was a, a, a Gaffel Kolsch from Germany. So uh, I, I love a good Kolsch. So, but I'm drinking one of my favorites as well, which is, if I can get it here. So just a Guinness extra stout. So always a really good beer. I've toured that factory a couple times in, uh, in Dublin and just uh, love Guinness. Oh, nice, nice. And from the state of Texas, about an hour and a half from me, I bring to you this Texas beer company, and it's a uh, Indian Pell Ale type beer at 6.5%. Nice. Known for the creative naming that they give their beers. <laughs> you duck. <laughs> I can put my leg down with plenty of when it's up on a thing. <laughs> so, so, Tony, why don't you take a moment and introduce our guests um, who are listening to us today uh, on what it is that you do and what your company does and focuses on, please. Sure. So uh, again, I'm Tony Cole, CTO <clears throat> for Ativo Networks. And uh, Chris and I met back in the early dawn of time. <laughs> Three floors yeah. down the Ruin building. Yep. Yeah. Lo- long ago, uh, when we were starting up really, uh, the Army Computer Emergency Response Team and the Land Information Warfare Activity where I uh, was not able to dress more comfortably like this back then, but uh, long, long ago. So I'm a, I'm a former cyber operator from the military and uh, spent time uh, doing a number of different things, running consulting groups for Semantic, McAfee, uh, and then uh, a number of years at FireEye as their global government critical infrastructure CTO, and then uh, decided I want to do something different. It's like a little, little grayer in the beard, a little longer in the tooth. And uh, I was started looking around and I know Chris has heard this story many times, but way back, my last assignment was at uh, Pentagon running security on the uh, backbone. And uh, I started playing with honey pots, really liked it. Met Lance Spitzner, who ran the HoneyNet project. And uh, Lance and I talked quite a bit, and I, I started implementing honey pots at the Pentagon. Liked the technology a lot. So joined a company that did honey pots, recourse technologies when I retired, semantic bottom up, and did away with that technology almost immediately. So six months after I got there. So Wow. So here it is, 17 and a half years later, I decided after five years of fire, I wanted to leave. And I started looking around and started looking at the deception space, you know, where honeypots had evolved to and absolutely was blown away with the capability. So I joined a TiVo Networks and uh, it's quite simple. They, they, we now do deceptively simple threat detection. So through deception. And uh, in the last couple of years now, we've seen NIST role deception into three different special publications, including cybersecurity framework. We have, you know, MITRE, MITRE attack has now added deception into the MITRE shield. So the new component on, you know, protecting your organization and deception is a huge component of it. In fact, I just did a podcast today with uh, Dr. Stan Barr with MITRE and Ron Ross from NIST. So talking about these things. So deception has come a real long way and it's a very interesting space, a lot of fun. 
Well, so it's NIST now? What's that? <laughs> it's in NIST, huh? So Yeah, yeah, it's in NIST now as well. You think it's ever going to make it to like 853 where they're going to have to have some form of uh, deception as a base capability or is it kind of like... It's in it. It's in it. It's in version five, which hasn't become final yet. So, but it is in version five. That draft is out there. Somebody can pull it down on the NIST website and review it. Uh, there are a number of security controls now that call out for deception. So great fun for us. It's like DC1, DC, what is it? What, you know what the, the acronym they're going to give it? Uh, SC26 is one, but there's also, uh, that one is decoys and there's others for misdirection, misinformation. You know, yeah. so there's there's a lot of different facets for it in it, but it's SC26 is a primary one that calls out decoys. Okay. Okay, wow. That's a new one for me. It tells you how yeah, a lot of people don't know it. A lot of people don't realize that. I'm not ready for version five. I'm not for That's going to be another <laughs> podcast where we're going to do like Tito's. Because uh, Tito's. He's going to cut 853 Rev 5. And they're only two hours from me. <laughs> I, do you know what's funny is I bet Ron Ross would love to do the this podcast if NIST would let Ron Ross do this podcast. <laughs> uh, so anyway, so when you got to TiVo, what, you know, it, what was it like? Let's talk the base product from a TiVo first, right? So I know I've had clients do it before. Pretty impressive stuff, right? So they drop it in. It looks like there's systems there. They're communicating back and forth. You know, so describe from the adversary view, right? Let's get away from all the regs for a second. Describe from the adversary sure. view what, I mean, it's supposed to look like everything else, but what does a TiVo do to make it look like everything else, right? Otherwise, I'm going to think it's just a honeypot and I could just run crappy old machines on my network, right? Yeah, it's, it's a lot different than that, you know, when um, the technology today is really accelerated. The weirdest thing in, in, you know, for you, for you guys that, you know, have been around for a while as well, you'll understand this. You know, when somebody's running a firewall or an IPS or, you know, a PIC technology, more often than not, they'll talk about it. They're on stage somewhere. Somebody's, well, oh, yeah, we run Palo Alto firewalls. But for some reason with deception, it is a very successful technology that no CISO wants to talk about. So it's really, really weird. So you don't hear a lot about it. There's very few that want to discuss it, thinking for some reason, you know, it's going to get you know, uh, discovered by the adversary. And that's absolutely not true. And we can certainly talk about that. So, so what is it in, in reality? It's, a, it's very, very simple. If you look at the broader structure of an environment today, you know, uh, we can go into a, a prospect and do a, a proof of value form. We typically, if they're on premise, you know, we would drop an appliance in there that will simply listen to traffic. So, from that traffic it's listened to, we'll present back after you know listening to it, say, here are the operating systems you're running, here's the applications you're running, here's the communications that we saw, here's what you should deploy. And by the way, these decoys all get deployed in your unused IP space. So across your entire environment, across your different VLAN. So we're projecting deception into your environment while running in unused IP space. So there's no impact on production at all. So, and that is the decoy component of it. We have lots of organizations that uh, are not sophisticated and they use it for detection only. So they're not doing any lean forward stuff. We have a lot of the, in fact, we've got six of the fortune 10 now as customers and they have gone through and many of them lean forward. So they've got their gold images they've incorporated into, you know, our decoy. So they're running their own data you know, in those decoys, which is just absolutely fascinating because they're studying the adversaries inside there. So that's the decoy component. Then across the production environment, we drop breadcrumbs, lures, so uh, deceptive documents across the production environment. And by that, I mean, we use any mechanism they have for pushing data, those systems, and it's extremely simple. So we'll take uh, deceptive active directory credentials, for instance, and put them in memory. And what user should be, you know, scraping memory? No one, <laughs> none, right? None if, if, you, uh, if you're doing uh, your controls properly. So all of those pieces that we put in there, any adversary finds that, we make them slightly alluring and it will lead them into the decoy environment. So any touch of those deceptive components on the production or any touch of a decoy is an alert and it's a high fidelity alert because no one's supposed to touch them. 
We've got new technology on endpoints, our endpoint detection net. And this one's super cool. And, and you know, we have been very successful with this one, even though we haven't had it out for that long. And what it does is it's got all of those pieces that I just talked about, all of those deceptive components, but it will allow, you know, anybody that's touching one of those systems to be drawn into a decoy environment, as well as alerting through the existing structures today. I'll give you a quick example. So that deceptive credential sitting in memory. So some guy comes in, sits down at his laptop, urgent email from the CEO, open this, uh, this spreadsheet, tell me what you think, right? So we know this happens all the time. It's a spoofed email, it's weaponized, that systems pop. Well, that adversary, when they go in and they look at that endpoint, what's really cool about it is that deceptive credential that they find will take them into a deceptive Active Directory server, for instance, in the decoy environment. If they were an insider in that same situation and uh, they find that Active Directory credential, that deceptive one, and they know where Active Directory is and they go do a query. So it's integrated with the SIM and with the other alerting structures and playbooks and such, and it will cause an alert, all hands on deck, somebody who's trying to use a deceptive credential. And the latest piece to that is AD Secure, which we just absolutely love. So that adversary tries to do a query as they more often than not will do to Active Directory. So when they attempt to do that query, so that query comes back, we intercept it and we provide deceptive Active Directory information back to the compromised uh, endpoint to the adversary. So they can't, they don't know what's real and what isn't real. It's really a lot of fun and I'll pause there. So, so with, with that, Tony, uh, just out of curiosity, somebody gets in, that spoofed email is open. That's, that's a breach to, to a lot of degree, right? Is the company, even though uh, you're able to handle that from a, a decoy perspective or the deception, is that still required for the company to publicly disclose that breach has happened, even though it hasn't really impacted any of their real data? That's a really good question, Al, and it's an area we typically stay out of. You know, we've got customers around the globe, so, you know, laws and regulations vary, you know, from country to country on that. So some of them, you know, disclose it, some don't. But, you know, the, the, the biggest piece for us is we help them mitigate the impact very quickly because they don't have an extended dwell time. So the adversary is not successful in moving east-west. You know, they can't do any lateral movement. So, you know, the, the EDN piece, not only does it allow, you know, for providing deceptive information back from Active Directory, but even on that compromised endpoint, really fun. We hide all of the shares. We hide, you know, uh, uh, any map drives and we provide deceptive ones back to the adversary. So anything that they're looking at, they don't know what's real and what isn't. So, and again, it's that art, science of deception. You can play with them as much as you want to. So Tony, Tony, we, 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 there's not a drinking game. We're not going to make you drink for it. EDM, endpoint deception. EDN, endpoint dis, uh, detection net. Okay, EDN. Yeah. I'm not making you drink for the first acronym, but I know that you <laughs> don't do that. I'm, I may have to dash out to my garage and get another one out of the beer fridge. A quick follow-up question then, Tony. In terms of endpoint, uh, with today's COVID environment and everybody working external to the corporate network, how are you dealing with uh, uh, people who are having to use their own systems and their own networks when still trying to attach to the corporate network in terms of this deception techniques? Yeah, that one's kind of a mixed bag. We have some customers that have gone through that and they're deploying our technology through their infrastructure to their, you know, uh, to their users' personal systems. And again, that varies depending on my country. Uh, you know, you go over to the EU and that's not, you know, not typically allowed. So I, I know there's some exceptions running over there, but typically you, you saw mass acquisition of technology and it rolled out as quickly as possible because they can't force home users or you know their workers to use their own personal technology but we've seen the technology get rolled out very quickly even to those organizations using personal devices so and they, they put their own mechanisms mechanisms in place to try and protect those users you know um, personal devices so it's it's you know it's an interesting challenge that we face today you know in this new structure Lots of new security issues. So when uh, we all moved to working from home and uh, as we all know, bypassed many of our existing perimeter controls in doing so. So, so that brings me a couple of points. So one is how much of, when you do the breadcrumbs and everything like that, 
Do you create false identities? Do you create an identity that has their own Office 365 account and their own LinkedIn? And, and do you, how, how, how extensive is a, a breadcrumb to look realistic? That's a great question. And it's a tremendous amount of fun and goes back to the, to the art and the science of deception. And we have a lot of customers that, uh, you know, don't have a large security team. So they don't have a lot of expertise. It's a very slim team. You know, many of them are SMBs, law firms and others, and they'll use it primarily for detection. So it's a, it's a pretty dry environment. They're not doing a lot of things with it. We have others, though, that are very lean forward, large organizations that are very reliant on their deception environment. And uh, I, I won't even tell you what vertical they're in because some of them have stepped way forward in exactly that. Yes, there's uh, some that are creating false social media personas. So to mirror, you know, what they built inside the environment. You know, and, and quite frankly, if you're getting targeted enough and you're working with law enforcement, you know, I, I know a lot of countries are permitting that today. So I, I, I think it's an interesting space to play in, and it certainly provides new capabilities we didn't have before and gives really new meaning and new punch to the term active defense. You know, we're not hacking back, but nevertheless, you know, we're certainly uh, putting the attackers inside our enterprise on very shaky ground where they can't trust what they're seeing. So I Has Gartner uh, or any of the industry analyst firms um, officially put out a quadrant for deception? Yeah, they won't put out a quadrant yet. So, and that's simply because they're, uh, and I'm not going to say it, uh, say it live, that would be up to Gartner to do, but revenues for any specific number of companies in an industry with the same technology has to hit a certain amount. And we're not at that amount of spend yet where they'll do it. Now, Gartner is doing a lot of deception. In fact, uh, Peter Shord next week at the Gartner Summit is speaking about deception again. They have it on and the I just yeah. At least put what's it on, that? We put it on the hype curve or anything like that. I mean, uh, I know we are. Yeah, we I are. On the I hype think curve. it's on the emerging technologies radar. <laughs> yeah, but it's yeah, not it's, on the say bad things hype curve about yet. You, Tony. Um, no, no, it is on the hype curve as well, Jeremy. Is it? it is. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I, I can pull that down. I've got it here somewhere. But uh, Gartner started to do a lot on deception about two years ago. They rated the top six vendors in deception. Uh, we won that hands down easily. <laughs> no, no bragging there. So it's, uh, it's Gartner's report, not ours and their analysis. Uh, but what's been really fun is to see a number of keynotes from Gartner talking about deception pretty frequently. Gorka Sadowski uh, did a lot on deception. Augusto Berrios, who left and he's now at Securonix. Uh, Securonix? Yeah, Securonix. Uh, but Gorka said things like, you know, in public quotes, he said these out there and a lot of them have been tweeted, simple, inexpensive, and it works. We don't know of a technology with a uh, lower signal to noise ratio and a number of other quotes as well. But it's really, really cool. Gartner has, has dove headfirst in this. And I'll give you one other one too, that uh, enterprise management analysts did a survey and said uh, deception users, you know, not our survey, EMAs, uh, it was sponsored by deception vendors, a consortium of them, but nevertheless, it was a survey of deception users. And they said they saw a 91% reduction in dwell time through using deception. Nice. Okay. How does, when, when you're going into a, into a customer opportunity, who do you find yourself competing against? Do you find, do you run up against Elusive or TrapX or any of those guys? Yeah, we see them occasionally but not consistently, you know, we'll, we'll bump into one of them in this account, one of them in this account, but we might hit three more where, you know, word of mouth, they've just chosen us. They do the POC and decide if they want the technology, but they don't bring anybody else in. Sure. So, but, but we That's do good. bump into to all of them, all the, the uh, players out there. We're definitely the market leader and uh, you know, it's hard to say, but based on estimates we've seen, we probably own 60 to 70% of the market. I, I've got a question. Go ahead, Chris. No, I was just saying it's still not big enough for Gartner. It sounds like there's co competition. It sounds like there's a light item, right? Okay. Yeah. I, you guys just don't pay them enough to make it a quadrant. Um, so, <laughs> one thing I have to ask you, though, is because this is what happens on, on, on a lot of times on honey pots and honey nuts and stuff, deception, is that people always look at the technology right and, and jeremy awesome to talk about the business aspect what about the management like the total cost ownership right how much how much time does it take listen 
I personally think the secret sauce be on how you manage it, not how it, I can emulate things left and right, right? Managing the emulation, collecting the data, consistent processes. How much, how much does a TiVo put into that? And, and, and could you speak about the, the ease of use and the integration of products like fluency? I, I, I don't know. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it's, it's funny you bring that up, Chris, because I don't know if you realize it, but you know a bunch of the engineering expertise behind uh, a TiVo network. So uh, I know they're Wanda over there. He's an excellent. I, I, say again. David Wine. Wow. Wine. Yeah. Yep. Wine. Yep. David's here over there. I mean, that's a you guys. You guys pick up some good talent. I mean, Dave should be an engineer. He shouldn't be doing sales. But uh, he's he's doing quite well. Let's let him do what he does. Okay. There you go. <laughs> So uh, what you may not uh, be aware of is the large team that built Introvert that McAfee bought years ago, that IPS solution, uh, all decided they wanted to do something different and looked at uh, different areas. Srikant Visametti, so Venu Visametti, so left and uh, along with a few others, and they started a TiVo network. So, you know, in, in the deception space way back in 2011, shipping product in 2014, and uh, today we're we're very successful in this space. We'll but back. you know, back to your yeah. yeah, back to your question. You know, I actually was doing a keynote this morning, so it's it's funny how you know these uh, systems work today. I found myself in Mexico City while still sitting in my living room this morning. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but that was one of the questions this morning, and uh, it's it's really fascinating. One of the things that we've done to try to make it simpler is we don't want to replace processes for all of our customers. We don't want to change the flow. We want to integrate into that flow. So we've got uh, about, I think it's 32, you know, integrations today that we have publicly listed on our webpage. And we're partnered with the likes of Cisco, Palo Alto, FireEye, McAfee, CrowdStrike, you know, uh, Phantom, uh, Demisto, Pick, right? But the point is that, uh, when we talk to customers and the way we've integrated this and tied into orchestration and, and the whole SOAR component, you know, where somebody can go through and get an alert and use their existing functionality to quarantine an endpoint, you know, change a firewall rule, any one of those things they can do through existing processes. So we've done a lot of analysis on what it takes. And uh, one of our, our large Fortune 10 customers says they dedicate and, and they lean a little bit forward in this area, not, not as far forward as others, but they lean pretty far forward into a lot of toying with the adversary inside the decoy environment. And they use about a half uh, man year of one person to manage the environment. Now they do more than that on the analysis side. I don't think they include any of their analyst team in that because that's just one more component of their analysis than the data they're looking at. But for managing it, it's, you know, half of one man year, you know, for a large enterprise customer. We're pretty proud of that based on the interface we have. It's one of the things that brought me over as I looked at the technology and I talked to more than just uh, a TiVo, I looked at a number of different deception vendors, but the interface was, was just, I thought, fantastic, had a lot of maturity to it. I joined in early 2018, so, and was just blown away and the technology's only accelerated since. So, so as a CTO and as you look at the technology, and we got Jeremy right here, right? So I got Jeremy into my Brady Bunch corner top. Um, so, one of the things that I was wondering is like, in a lot of technologies, MSSPs and, and like MDRs, right, take care of EDR data. Is there, are there MSSPs that actually deliver deception as part of their service? Have you ever thought about uh, marketing to the M MSSP slash MDR market space? Yeah, I will tell you, uh, we've started working with them now on partnerships. We've got a few partnerships in place. None are publicly announced yet but we've gone through and we've added components into the product to make it easier for them, multi-tenancy, many things like that. So where they can really, you know, uh, dive deep into this. And I expect that uh, probably maybe even before the end of this year, we'll see some rollouts of additional services based on, you know, offering deception as a service. And we have capabilities in that area as well. For instance, uh, we're doing, 80 secure trials and active directory assessments today that we offer as a trial. Somebody can sign up, you know, and get it 30 days for free, you know, where we deliver that service to them and they can get their, their systems assessed, you know, for, uh, for how to protect active directory using our AD secure technology. So, so we'll, we'll continue to expand out doing deception as a service, but 
but at the same time, we have no intention of dominating that space and every intention of partnering with the big players in it today. And we already have some agreements in place, some, some of the larger ones. So you're looking at the bigger MSSPs to push it down, I mean, from a service, but I mean, I guess what I'm getting, Tony, is like, like we're, we're working a lot with the S, you know, small, medium business, SMB market space. And, and one of the questions I was asking is, is like, how does an SMB get involved with a TiVo? I mean, is there, is there a good price point? Is this, is this not something that big boys play? Cause you, you talked about the big boys top yeah. and top one, you know, top 500, fortune 500. What about, what about the SMB market spaces is, is, is a TiVo there yet? Or do you think that they're, I mean, they're definitely the lead player, right, Tony? I mean, they're de- if they can't get to the SMB market space, nobody will. I mean, is, is TiVo moving down the stream to, to, to everybody to make it more consistent or are they still just focus on 500? Or, or, or is that, that the relationship that the MSSP is going to provide for you? Well, the, but they, that's the reason why I led with the MSSP at first, right? Because yeah. MSSP definitely could, could enter that space for the guys. Yeah, it's really surprising to me that uh, some of the MSPs haven't moved more quickly because we have a tremendous amount of customers in the SMB space today already. So that have bought through directly through us or, you know, through our multitude of channel partners that we have that play in that space. So I suspect we're going to see that adoption probably when some of the larger MSPs roll out these capabilities as a service that we'll see some of the SMB market already pick it up because we advertise quite a bit that, you know, a uh, this structure in the SMB space is a good play for us. The cost point, as you mentioned, Chris, is is really excellent for them. So, and the fact that they can pick up detection and augment, you know, uh, maybe an older EPP technology on the endpoint versus having an EDR. And we've already done a lot of tests using MITRE attacks, do-it-yourself tool to show how we add great value on top of uh, EDR. We did a public report on that. So even those SMBs that are a little bit more lean forward, you know, we still give them great capabilities at a very low cost point. So yes, I, I think that area is going to expand a lot for us. And simply put, uh, we probably haven't spent enough time focused on the MSPs at a TiVo, you know, for that SMB market yet. Tony, as you look at, at the at SMB space, are, we all know that many of these companies really have turned a blind eye to cybersecurity overall yeah. on average, right? And a lot of them, you know, they'll, they think they have to be an expert in everything in order to do it. And the fact is that they don't. And that's where a lot of value with these MSSPs and MDRs come in. But as you go in and you, you make sales to these SMB spaces, are you encountering a scenario where they're exclusively using your toll as a cybersecurity tool, as opposed to other layers of security like EDRs, right? And, and SIMs and things of that nature. Not usually, but that conversation happens a lot, Al. So we'll be in there and, and our sales team will report back, you know, conversation, you know, with, with this CISO or, or sometimes even CIO and occasionally even CEO, you know, that will ask, all right, if I buy this, what can I do away with? And, you know, quite frankly, our recommendation is you can't do away with anything initially. We have seen a number of customers that have looked at their, their stack and said, all right, I've got this in place. I've had deception in here now for two years and I've still seen breaches this time, this time, this time, and this time. Here's what it went around. Here's outdated technology that's leaving my stack and I'm up- updating it, you know, with something newer or I'm just chucking it out and going to rely on, you know, what I've got for, you know, my, my uh, firewalls and, you know, my EDR and my deception tech. And, and that's relatively limited, but, but we do see that over a period of time some of the ones that are a little bit more sophisticated starting to eliminate technology stacks. But we make sure people know, I mean, even with the testing we did with MITRE ATT&CK or our EDN in conjunction with the EDR tool sets that were tested for APT29 and APT3, you know, we show we're not trying to say, don't buy EDR, buy EDN. It's like, no, if you've got EDR, here's the gaps in it. And here's where, you know, uh, EDN fills in all those gaps. Jeremy, I mean, you're, right. you're the MSSP expert. <laughs> so as, as you listen to this, I mean, delivery wise, I mean, this is an obvious sell to a big company, right? Mm-hmm. And Tony, you don't deserve a job because it, it's too obvious, but, <laughs> but it, it's an obvious sell to a big company, right? But what about, I mean, as you listen to it and stuff like that, how do you package and kind of sell 
deception because the general public really doesn't understand it. Yeah, and, and that's a difficult point. You know, I, I had a conversation with a gentleman, uh, an old friend of mine in Europe, and he was looking through. It's like, ah, your marketing is, isn't, uh, you know, clear enough, not concise enough. And that's a problem you have for any company. You know, today when you're introducing new technology, you know, you have some of those people that, you know, it's like, oh, I know that, I know that, I know that. Come on, get to the point. And you've got others like, what the hell are you talking about? You know, they, they have never done anything with honeypots. They don't understand, you know, how virtualization has changed the structure of honeypots. You know, they don't understand the extensibility built into a framework today where you can tie in other products, you know? Yeah. So, so it's, it's, it's very, very difficult. And we've got a lot of structures. I mean, we've got a YouTube video, you know, a, a number of them actually, but a lot of them that are three minute videos that are literally uh, a farmer. So with a flock of sheep, and then we've got, you know, uh, some wolves out there in sheep's clothing, you know, all animated and stuff, trying to explain the deception concepts, you know, mm -hmm. where this time, instead of the wolf in sheep's clothing is a bad guy, you know, that's a defender, you know, that's a defender tool set that the shepherd actually has put in place or farmer has put in place, however you want to look at it. But uh, it's, it's not an easy task today to explain this because of the varying levels of knowledge that you have around this space. I mean, so Jeremy, I mean, as you listen, I'm fascinated from your point of view, because I mean, end all, we have to sell, right? And engage and be a, be a benefit to our customer, right? Uh, so I, I, you know, to be perfectly honest, we off, we offered deception as a service to our MSP customers a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. We were partnered with a company called Galwa. They make a product called CyberChaff. Um, it, we pushed, they had some pretty interesting tech. It was a little immature. Um, we looked at TrapX. It was, it's, we found it to be a, a little bit of a barrier to get people to really understand what it does, right? How, why do I need to spend, and maybe it's why do I need to spend so much money on something like this? Where at the time, they were, maybe it's more important to upgrade firewalls or put a new EPP system in place or something. But the, the, we, we found for the customers that did adopt it, um, it was successful. Perhaps the product we were leveraging or representing wasn't uh, on par with what Ativo has to offer. One of the things that, one of the questions I have for you, Tony, is, how well can I emulate some of my enterprise systems? Let's say I'm a healthcare company. Can I emulate, can you emulate Epic? Can you emulate some of these EMR systems um, and, and bring them into like that, to get them into the point where they think they're into the, the EMR database or my Oracle Financials database or SAP? Yeah, we, we've had a lot of fun over the years. <clears throat> taking the structure and ensuring that deception is authentic. So regardless of the environment and, you know, you, you guys are all, uh, you know, veterans in this industry, you know, there's no perfect solution, but nevertheless, we've tried really hard and we've brought a lot of great capabilities in place. And to give you an example and uh, uh, kind of stretching it out where I was trying to remember the name of the company, but, you know, in the medical field, so we built a deceptive uh, insulin pump, so at the request of a customer, you know, through a partnership with one of the medical device makers and nice. dropped it into our first healthcare facility. And this is a, a few years ago. We've got a really good use case study that we built on this. And the first thing that happened was they had a new x-ray system that had just come in. So they turned that system on. It came pre-compromised from the factory. So you still don't know if it was malicious intent or sloppy manufacturing. Don't know. And they didn't share with us, even though we asked. <laughs> and, uh, Anyway, it, it started hitting all these systems and our decoy insulin pump, you know, caught that thing immediately, but all of their other controls were bypassed. So we've done lots of things like that, putting things inside the IOT space, the SCADA space, point of sale, you know, for retail space. Uh, I'll give you a great example. Next week, I'm going to, uh, I did a panel this week for Billington cybersecurity with uh, department of energy, Alex Gates and, uh, and Jerry Cochran from PNNL. So, and next weekend I'm doing another one with PNNL. So, talking about energy because Department of Energy uh, put a contract in place, a commercialization fund structure for us 
through PNNL, and we're rolling out new deception for cyber physical systems. So for certain manufacturers. So, so there's many things that we're doing out there trying to take deception down as far as we can into the stack as, you know, multiple places we can, you know, so for instance, if somebody's got VoIP phones, okay, well then let's emulate that VoIP phone server so that we can actually bring deception to bear at that point in time. And, and if somebody's hitting one of those for a vulnerability, they're hitting the decoy versus hitting the real server. So no perfect solution, but much of that soft underbelly we've hit really, really hard. Oh, that's pretty impressive. I mean, it sounds like a lot of love that you have to give to your uh, end customers to be able to listen to and emulate something they want. Um, it, it, it is. And, and on that point, Chris, uh, I was, you know, uh, not long ago was talking with a, a very large casino customer of ours. And they're like, we want you to do more now because they've rolled it out enterprise wide globally. And they're like, now we want more on the power side because that's an area of concern for us, which is what led us to P&L, led us to Department of Energy and, and what we built today. So we're, we're working on all those facets. It's just, it's a tremendous amount of effort. And as you guys know, you know, when you're building out in new areas, you got to make sure that there's a market there to sell it if you're going to build it. Yeah, and, and, and I noticed you avoid names. So Home Depot <laughs> was rolling it out. And I noticed Home Depot, what they really liked about your product was as they acquired you never think of them as acquiring other people, but they acquire other companies. Yeah. What they really liked about your product was, was that they could deploy it into their new acquisition and they could say, wow, these guys are screwed, right? Like it, it, it's a snapshot of how bad a network is, right? So, you know, I, I think it's kind of interesting that you, you know, you're, you're good about not bringing up companies. I'm terrible. But, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it is, I think one of the bigger value propositions early on that I heard from companies that are big, and that's the reason why I was talking to SMB with you, is, is that big, it's obvious. I mean, I, I think if there's a big company guy out there right now who doesn't understand deception, he needs to go back to school, right? I mean, it really is an obvious buy. Well, uh, I think the MITRE, the MITRE attack, MITRE shield, the NIST pieces are going to help a lot. I mean, it's, I've heard as much as 45% of the U.S. large enterprise now are NIST cybersecurity framework users. Yeah. So, so if they're looking at that, you know, then they should be listening and hearing about deception as well. So I agree with you hundred percent there. I mean, tough for SME. So, so Tony, I, I think this is going to be a bizarre question. So we've talked a lot about a TiVo and everything like you are the master of being a CTO. Everywhere you go, you're, you're, you need to pick up that acronym really well. What is a CTO? Like, listen, I understand a CTO for most companies. And it kind of shocked me when I was at McAfee to really understand the position of a CTO. But can you talk to people about what it is to be a CTO for a security company? I mean, you're not yeah. the CTO, you're the CTO. So you want to talk about what a CTO's job is? I mean, that's, it's a kind of a different kind of thing in the, in the security world. It, it certainly is. You know, uh, when you look at CTO roles for a lot of security companies, and there is no hard and fast definition for one, it, it does vary even, even in the security vendors quite a bit. But my role really is, is strategy and vision for the company. So I spend a, a large chunk of my time externally facing, but I also spend a large chunk of my time internally facing, taking those conversations that I've had externally back to the company. I'll look at, you know, our marketing. I have conversations with our CMO frequently. Uh, my boss is the CEO. So, of course, I'm talking to, to Shark Athari all the time about what we should be doing. You know, let's pick up a new advisor in this region. Uh, I talk to engineering pretty frequently, the product management team a lot. But it's really strategy and vision. The really fun thing at this company is, you know, things that I might have asked for at another company. You know, I want product engineering reporting to me. At this company with guys like Srikant Visametti, you know, is uh, the head of engineering. It's like, yeah, no, you know, so Srikant, we should do this. Oh, we tried that or we thought about that and we ran into this, 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 and this. Like, oh yeah, <laughs> thought about that. Or we should do that. Yeah, we could do that. It'll take two weeks. So that's the type of conversations that, that we typically have. You know, uh, it's just very, very adaptable. So what I might have wanted it to happen at FireEye totally different situation here because different leadership here over the different groups. Product management doesn't report to me here. 
Uh, product engineering doesn't report to me here, and, and and I like it just like that, and I think they like it the same way. We've got a great relationship, so so it's really strategy and vision across the company, and talking to all the other heads and their teams. So ensuring that we're all going down the same path, we're all having the same conversations, you know, and uh, driving the company forward from a sales, product engineering, so and delivery and go to market, you know, structure that. Uh, Sinks well across all the divisions. So I, you know, so to tell you, I hate to say, it, man, I there are days where I wake up and I still think of you from 1994. I still think, <laughs> Nicole, sitting in front of a sir, looking through reports. Uh, where did you pick up the skill sets that you did? Like, listen, there's people all the time who say, "Chris, mentor me," and I'm like. I don't have time to go to the bathroom. I don't have time to mentor anybody, right? How did you pick up the skills that you do have? Because you're you're not the same Tony Cole. Like, listen, I'm I'm fortunate enough that I keep on meeting you over and over against the years, right? And when I think of you, often I think of the Tony Cole I, I knew at McAfee, right? But even now, you're not that guy, right? So where did you pick up the skills and the know-how and the knowledge? You weren't going back to school, were you? You, you didn't get pick up a... No. Yeah, what I didn't know you. Okay. Reading, Kindle. Kindle. <laughs> Reading and, I, and I'll tell you, you know, uh, never being afraid, you know, to, uh, to fail a little bit. You know, uh, I, I've always, you know, reached out there quite a bit and, and overstepped what I thought I was capable of and uh, then adjusted, you know, accordingly. So, all right, I, you know, one of my favorite books over there, I don't have an MBA, but I've got a book over there called Personal MBA that's, you know, falling apart that I read through over and over and over <laughs> to make sure I understand everything on, you know, uh, on the financial side, working with my, my uh, CFO, Gilbert, who's a great guy. So very helpful, you know, and same thing at, at previous companies, but being engaged, you know, very, very frequently. I was very lucky in the situations I was in. You know, uh, I've got a few friends. Oh, man, you're so smart. It's like, yeah, excuse my language here, but bullshit. You know, so I was lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time and just smart enough to recognize that opportunity and to leap on it. So uh, uh, the Pentagon, you know, uh, running security on the backbone, that was a great learning experience. And you've heard this before, Chris, because I had, you know, all of the responsibility with none of the authority over any of my users. So I was beat up. Welcome to the government. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I was beat up on a frequent basis, but I, I learned a tremendous amount. And in that position, I had access to, you know, uh, the joint staff, uh, OSD, and, and so many different areas in there, you know, where uh, I would ask questions, they would say, wow, this guy seems to, you know, have some really good questions, and they would throw some more stuff on me, you know, do this, you're now the wireless waiver authority for the Pentagon, that one made me laugh. It's like, you know, I was a peon, and I owned wireless waiver authorities for the Pentagon. But the point is just being, you know, uh, able to take advantage of these opportunities. One of the first guys advising Wall Street, the Gerson Lehrman Group on cybersecurity, you know, where it's going and what the market looks like before people were really even looking at this, working part-time on weekends while I was still military. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been a long road. So basically, yeah. just, basically just keep on learning, right? Eventually. Yeah, know. that's it. Well, and, and you've parlayed that into a relationship with NASA. Is that, yeah, I'm, uh, on a, I'm on the advisory council for NASA. That's their board like structure appointed by the NASA administrator. And uh, it's a tremendous amount of fun. That's one that to me has been fascinating. I was brought on there for my cybersecurity expertise, but I've leaned over numerous times. In fact, uh, you know, a former astronaut sitting next to me, space shuttle commander sitting next to me. And it's like, what are they talking about? <laughs> and he's whispering in my ear because, you know, it's like, Okay, today I'm learning about heliophysics. And that's one of those roles where, you know, it's really funny. As, a, as an Uber geek, I have to keep my mind focused. Like, think about risk. Think about how, how do the, your concepts of risk apply to this versus just completely geeking out and listening to these, you know, uh, physicists, astronauts, you know, rocket, en- uh, rocket engineers. And it, 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 to me, it's fat. Anyway, I'm, I'm done this year. So with NASA on, uh, I haven't announced it yet. I guess I am now, but uh, uh, October 25th after four years. So uh, I'm going to roll off my my last appointment. So uh, with NASA, which I'll miss, but at the same time, it's been fun. 
and it's taken up a lot of my time. So it'd be nice to get that time back and I'll be rooting for them constantly because I just absolutely love what they do. Well, does that mean you're, you're going to put more time into your role at ISC Square or do you uh, have actually, other, other things to do? Well, at, at TiVo keeps me very, very busy. ISC Squared, I'm the treasurer and I uh, co-chair Audit and Risk, you know, and uh, it's a little org. We only have 155,000 members around the globe. So, uh, but I'm up for re-election. Uh, actually, I think it opens next week for re-election. So we'll see if the constituents re-elect me. If so, then I'll serve another three years on ISC Squared. And uh, then I'll be done with that because it's built into the structure. You can only do six years and then you're done. Wow. So my design, what, yeah. And so do you have any influence or um, input into the the framework that they're training on for the CISSP or any of your other certifications? Yeah, the way the board is structured today, uh, the organization doesn't work for the board. The CEO, so works for the board. In fact, I was on the CEO succession committee. We just picked a new CEO. The, uh, the last one had been there six years and decided not to renew his contract. Wants to go do some different things. Made some, David Shearer has done some wonderful things and this is public, it's, it's rolled out already. He's announced it. So, but uh, Claire Rosso, we, we've now uh, appointed as a CEO. She'll start on October 1st. And the current structure, uh, I don't see changing. She reports to the board and we actually build a strategy with her and she implements that strategy across the entire organization. So, and that's, that's by design. There's been a lot of changes to the, to the way the board is structured and the way the board engages with the organization over the years. And I think it runs pretty well today, and I think they're making some really good strides. Damn, hey, Tony, I, we could have had like a whole hour talking about that crap. I mean, I was, I was thinking about that people. Man, Jeremy, you do too much homework. <laughs> That's my important day job, though, Chris. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm trying to be prepared. Job. You, you may yeah, ask back because I do have a technical question. How, how does, with your EDR product, how does that play in this uh, – the ED endpoint of uh, product that you have, how does that play with the EDR products like CrowdStrike or Sentinel One in terms of is there combat going on because you're a honeypot out there and you're trying to do things to, to deflect stuff, but yet they're trying to remediate you know, issues and things like that. Is there is there a conflict at the endpoint? No, no conflict at all. Great question, Al. Thank you. Uh, we partner with many of them and we'll sit on our way. I'm sorry, Chris. It's not a good question. You'd be nice. Al. <laughs> of course, it's passive. It, it requires something to initiate the initial response. But anyways, go on. Well, <laughs> and, and, and you're just adding on to Al's question, not to interrupt, I apologize. But are you putting software on the endpoint or are you putting an appliance in that's, that's uh, yeah. broadcasting the decoys across the unused IP space? Yeah. We're doing yeah. both. We're doing both. both. EDN. EDN is a standalone technology so that someone can acquire that's just on the endpoints and provides, you know, the AD secure for, you know, uh, securing active directory and provides the breadcrumbs and lures. So, but we also have the bot sync, the decoy environment, by the way, that plays on-premise hybrid and cloud, you know, deceptive S3 buckets, deceptive Lambda functions, deceptive config files, whatever you want there. And by the way, AWS, Azure, Google, uh, Oracle, uh, VMware pick. So there's more. So, but uh, we, we cover most of the large cloud platforms out there across the board. But in answer to your question, Al, you know, uh, we work very closely with the EDR companies. One of the things that we balanced very carefully was to show the value that EDM provides on the endpoint in conjunction with EDR. So, and if you look, and I mentioned this a little bit, just barely touched on earlier, MITRE ATT&CK did testing with the EDR vendors and they tested a, a whole slew of them. So earlier this year and last year, so with using APT3 and APT29 and published those results without any scores. So we took those results, compiled scores from the results that anybody can replicate. So, cause you know, those, those you know, scores are, are readily available. The results are readily available, can be compiled into scores. We did a flat and a weighted scoring. And then we took the MITRE ATT&CK do-it-yourself tool. So, and we tested against APT29. So, and looked at the areas we covered versus where the EDR tools covered, showed all the gaps, and then added our scores to the EDR vendor scores. And then we had, and you mentioned a minute ago, Chris, uh, 
uh, Ed Amoroso, so the former uh, CISO at at and published a great paper for us, so talking about the value that EDN provides to EDR tool manufacturers today, because many of those scores that the EDR uh, tested products provided, so were MSP scores and manual scores added to. So here's somebody that goes in and they actually dig through their intelligence, they find a solution, and here's how we respond to that something they've scripted or, or something they've added. That's being eliminated in the next set of testing. So that is driven a closer partnership with the EDR vendors than we had seen in the past. So, and I think that's gonna be very successful, especially as the new test comes out. Mitre has already announced they're testing uh, any, any of these EDR vendors now with Carbonac and Fin7. So it's gonna be a lot of fun to see how this one comes out. Nice, well, thank you for that, I appreciate it. So, so uh, my, my last question is I, I know we're we keep we can go all night. I, I got more beer in the fridge. Yeah, um, as long as you have beer, he's he's good to go. <laughs> good. Yeah. The questions get sillier, but you yes. know <laughs> the answers may as well. <laughs> so, so roadmap wise, right? So you you must think all the time, oh my God, what am I doing next? And and to you, it's obvious, right? I need this. I want this. I want that. Right. Where is Sativa going? I mean, you know, when we look at your company from a, from the outside looking in, we see where you are, right? And, and the question really is, where do you think deception is going? Forget NIST. That's the past, right? That's that's what Gartner wants. That's where so and so wants. Where do you think deception's going? Where do you what, what's the big ask that you're hearing? Yeah, so I have to be careful here. You know, I, I don't want to reveal too much publicly, but I'll say, you know, one of the solutions we've just rolled out and we're, we've got new capabilities going into it. You need to drink more because that, that should have just been, just tell yeah, me. Yeah, this should just roll off your tongue. <laughs> we're all under NDA here, right? Okay. <laughs> that delivery van when you need it. Nothing public here, but uh, our, our ransomware, you know, capabilities, you know, uh, to, to me, this is a great fun one. We're adding new functionality into that. That's going to make it even more interesting. But today, you know, uh, system gets compromised. We all know what happens. You know, we're calling it ransomware 2.0. It doesn't matter what you, what you want to call it, but you know, that, that adversary wants to move laterally. They want to find some interesting information, exfiltrate it, and then do the encryption. So, because then they got you coming or going, you know, it's like, oh, you're not going to pay us for the key. Well, we get your data already. We're going to release this, and this is embarrassing to you. So we're hiding those those shares on those systems. Map drives we're hiding. We're prov providing back instead, you know, uh, deceptive ones. So mm -hmm. uh, we we've got capabilities already built in there where, you know, you get compromised. So and as it tries to encrypt the system, you can keep pumping data into it. So <laughs> so it never finishes encrypting even. So it's yeah. so many different fun things that you can do, and we're adding to that capability. Lance will give you a big wet kiss right now. So you're basically like, you remember tar pitting, like keeping an avid yeah. on the machine so long. Wow. Well, that's good. That's cool. That's cool. All right, Al. Do you have any intention of putting your or integrating your product on edge devices like firewalls or SD-WAN appliances? Do you see an evolution like that? Yeah, that's certainly possible down the line. We've, we've not got a lot of requests from the large cyber vendors. And, you know, quite frankly, many of them are a little slow to wake up to the value of deception. And it's it's been the last couple of years as Gartner now is talking about it at every conference. And, you know, I, I will tell you, you know, doing a podcast that I did today, so that will be played next month. So uh, for we'll just say a large financial services conference. <laughs> so but but. <laughs> What's that? Because uh, because they get up just that, but but let's plug just away, say, plug away. It's a free plug between mitre, between mitre, <laughs> Dr. Stanley Barr and Dr. Ron Ross today on that podcast. They mentioned deception over twenty times. I was counting, so I was just had a little ticker here and was counting, and that's really having a, a large play for us. So yeah, every time you hear the word deception, you got to do a shot. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, listen, I have to. I have to believe, given given the military background and the government background, that that your product, if not others, are heavily used within the government agencies trying to give disinformation out to those foreign nations trying to come in and stuff. I can't imagine why big companies wouldn't want to use this, especially 
uh, even smaller companies that hold very valuable patents, right? That, that this would be such a critical um, component of their whole cybersecurity mission. Yeah, Al, the problem is that the government works different than the rest of the world. The government has people. The government, the government will spend money on security because they have a line item and a budget. They're, they're not a business. They don't have to be efficient. Businesses are efficient, right? And, and I think that what is going to make Activo special, why it's going to be the up the shark, finally honeypot company, is total cost ownership. It's the ability to push out deception without having a full-time body on it yeah. to do it. I mean, to tell you the truth, the, the, the government is a, is, a, is a tar pit for, for, for Beltway bandits to, to people continually sell crap back into it, and you and I and the rest of the taxpayers pay for it, right? And it, it's crazy. But Ativo, really, you, you brought up, what is that stupid? It was a recourse. What was that damn company that was definitely? Recourse. Recourse Re Technologies. God, it sucked. It really did. It was really designed <laughs> for the government, right? Because to, to be able to manage what people don't understand, it's not the quality of the deception. Because the attacker, nine times out of ten, is automated. It's the ability to manage and deploy and to show value, right? And, and, and I know I said I wasn't going to say anything else, but Tony, I mean, that's to me the, the big advantage of TiVo. I mean, I've seen it in action. I've seen it with, with, with it out in, in, in hospitals, uh, you know, Home Depot was one example. I mean, the value at the end of the day is the fact that for the dollars spent and what was discovered, it was better than freaking no before, right? And no before is dirt, dirt, damn cheap. You, right? you know what's funny, Chris? Not anymore. We have, <laughs> we have some, some CISOs that we have to explain to them. They'll, they'll do a, a proof of value with us. Some call it a proof of concept. I don't really care how they want to phrase it but it just makes me chuckle. It's like, you guys don't light up very often. It's like, yeah, that's a good thing. <laughs> you know, it's like, we're not lighting up because we're not pumping your analyst full of false positives. When it lights up, it's all hands on deck. It's a real alert. Somebody's in your alert. environment. So <laughs> we're getting them to understand that. And on your comment on, on, on the government, you know, we've done pretty good in the government. We saw a large awakening here not too long ago. And it was uh, thanks to, to our friends at MITRE that have a whole division now focused on deception. And uh, they did a, a white paper. So uh, inviting them in, it was called, I think was the name of the white paper that MITRE did. And uh, this PhD rolled this out and told uh, DOD and the defense industrial base, pretty much I'll, I'll summarize the entire paper. If you're not using deception, you're stupid. <laughs> that, that's pretty much what that paper says. Yeah, deception is excellent. I, it really is. But the question is the ease of implementation, the ease of management. Yeah. It comes with a good product. That doesn't come with a good idea, right? No, that's absolutely true. So, so you know, you, you bless the guys that started at TiVo, and I think that, you know, they're all good people. And, and the fact that the key right now is a roadmap to how deception is going to change, right? Because you know the adversary is going to be changing towards it. And then the last thing, like I said, is, is – in the very beginning is, is how does it impact the SMB? I think that, and not that not anybody listening to this conversation is going to be concerned about the SMB, but the reality is when it gets down to that level, you know, it's real, right? You know that, that this is, is as, as good as AV, right? Right, Jeremy, well, so Tebow, Tony's going to call you after this. He's going to sign an NDA and, and, and an exclusive. Good. An exclusive for SMB sales. They're, That's they're right. It shouldn't, it shouldn't just be EvoTech. It should be us at Fortify. Just remember that. Well, let's talk. Let's, let's talk. talk. XDR.com. Yeah. Jeremy, you, you did yeah, your I, research, I, didn't I, you? I, I, <laughs> uh, yeah. You, you're, uh, I'm a cyber sleuth. <laughs> I, I know you uh, are friends with Macy <laughs> over there, so it's all good. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, Tony, we're, we're at the top of the hour here, and, and uh, we certainly want to extend our thanks for your participation. I personally learned a lot. I hope our audience, as they go through and listen to this, will learn a lot more than they knew before. And I think the message is clear. Deception. And, and he's being and shitty. He's playing in that part. I'll try it again. From one veteran to another, I want to thank you for your service. Start that way. 
now I, I presume you were army was. tony yeah 20 years he was a shitty army guy I, 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 I grew up as an army brat and said the hell with this and joined the navy so yes from oh, one wow. veteran to another thank you thank you for yours as well <laughs> thank you Tony. thank you so much gentlemen tony. thank you i had a lot of fun doing this you ever want me to come back and drink beers and run my mouth i'm happy to do it so i'm good at both of those We'll, oh yeah. We'll just wait for that delivery van to get there with your beer. So <laughs> we'll just see when the beer shows up. We can keep on doing it.